Let's, um, let's turn to John chapter 12. <clears throat> we'll look at a couple of things there in a minute as you're turning there. Um, I will continue on a couple of statements I was making just before the end of the last session. We were talking about it, Jesus giving up uh, glory, he, that, he, that he, you know, I hadn't used this phrase, but I, I remember using it in some of my other notes. Jesus veiled his glory. He veiled his glory. Now that's significant because that means that Jesus might be the actual true fulfillment of the Holy of Holies. And that there are certain things that he is veiling that he didn't want them to see and be motivated by. And that the rent veil um, is the revelation of Christ. Um, in fact, the word revelation is properly translated unveiling. Or you could say rent veiling. <laughs> and... Um, and so there is this reality. You know, a lot of times we tend to think that that veil was up more or less by the devil or by the law or by something negative. And, and I, I believe there are aspects of, uh, from many sides, but that was something God ordained. And it was something that God didn't want to let them in on through seeing official glory. That his heart always was that his people know him or he wouldn't have dwelt in the midst of them. But that they not know him based on what he does. No matter how great and powerful and mighty and wonderful it is, not based on what he does in terms of Godhood attributes, but rather the essence of God to be known. <clears throat> All right. So, um, the official glory of his office, he veiled, he hid. The titles and positions that, he, that were rightly his, he veiled, he hid. Um, any glory that came by reason of position or relationship to God on a personal way as son, he veiled. Now again, we'll see examples of stuff coming up, but then we'll see what his response is. This is so we're barely we're barely setting the groundwork for this, okay? I have plenty of ammunition as we go forward. And and of course if one class just by sharing this in one class, we've been reduced down this much. Just think of two classes. <laughs> All right, Jesus in his person, and of course, when we say his person, we're talking about that sweet savor that the Father loves and appreciates. <clears throat> He's the same. Let me just draw two circles on the board. If he is... Son of God, in that circle, and this one over here, Son of Man, we, you know, Jesus is Son of God and Son of Man. Okay. So he's not divided like this into two circles, but... For teaching's sake, we do things like this so that we can examine it a little more closely. When you examine the essence, the essence, not the power, not the omniscience, all-knowingness, all, not all of that stuff. We're talking about the essence of his being. Son of God and Son of Man is the same person because it's who he is. It's his being. It's not his doing. It's not his power. It's not his position. It's not his right by, by reason of being God. It is who he is in nature. And whether he's sitting on the throne in all glory as son of God 
when you examine the depth of that being in that essence, it's exactly the same person who humbled himself, became obedient unto death, took upon himself form of a servant, on and on and on. It is exactly the same being because he can't stop being who he is. He can only stop doing what he did, and he can only stop promoting himself based on higher attributes that, we, that I've, I've termed official glory. So his selflessness could not be hidden. His selflessness could not be hidden because it rested with who he was innately and not what superpowers he possessed because of Godhood. You know, does that make sense? Yes, question or? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, his selflessness could, be, could not be hidden because it rested with who he was innately and not what superpowers he possessed because of Godhood. Uh, the original statement I made that I have read uh, so many times I cannot tell you that kenosis is that he emptied himself of his visible glory. Is anybody picking up on that now? What I meant and what maybe they meant when they said that, that he emptied himself of his visible glory, meaning all the glory in connection with being God or all the glory in connection with being Messiah or all the glory in connection with any official thing and he walked as the son of man to bring glory to God. Okay? <clears throat> Again, there are, you know, at this early stage, there are angles your mind can take. We'll get into a bunch of those, and we'll try to cover the ground for those kind of things. Only what was discovered by faith based on not acts of God such as miracles, for many saw these, but acts of selfless nature were acknowledged. <clears throat> so we will, we will uh, look at different situations that Jesus is in and the thing that causes him to uh, either rejoice or to not acknowledge it, uh, even his own disciples rejoicing because they missed the point and they were moving toward official glory. And let's face it, if you just, just give a thought the disciples were constantly moving toward official glory. You know, when will the kingdom appear? Uh, da, 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 I mean, over and over and over and over. They, you know, who, who will be the greatest? Who's going to sit on your right hand and your left? I mean, their minds were there, and his mind was not there at all. Let this mind, let this attitude be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. <clears throat> and so... Um, There was a glory to Jesus that pertained to a particular nature. All that he did in service or said were a witness of what he was because they were an expression of him. So this thing of, um, there was this thing in his heart that he wanted people to discover who he was but not to base their discovery because their discovery would usually come on an official glory basis, not to base it on an official glory, but by discovering him. Okay? And I had you turn to John 12. Uh, of course, you're going to get the substance of who he is in John 12, 23, 24, 25, you know, 26 there, you're going to see who he is in nature and what he's really after, which is going the exact opposite direction of what, if you're, if you're trying to gain official glory, Jesus going to the cross was in the wrong direction. Um, there are, there's a vast amount of people who could never believe that Jesus actually was the Son of God because they, you know, they say, well, God would never kill himself, or God would never die, or God would never go to the cross. God would be, you know. And in fact, uh, Hindus 
are very much opposed to adding Jesus to the God factor because they got, what, 300 million? You know, that's some huge, huge amount of gods. They don't want to add Jesus to it because they don't believe that God would, is, would be honorable or would be truly God and come down here and die. God wouldn't just do that. Okay. So, well, that's not strike one. That's strike one, two, and three. You're out. And you'll never know it. And uh, so Jesus begins to describe his mission based on his being, which is selflessness. Accept the seed, fall on the ground, and die. Um, by this, you know, talk about perceiving the love of God. Um, that love whereby he gave himself for the ungodly. Okay. You don't give yourself, you give your, for a righteous man, you might give yourself. Why? Because you'll go down in history with official glory. You see what I mean? I'm telling you, this thing is like, you know, tentacles all the way through this thing of the reality that man, the fallen man, the fallen race of mankind is motivated towards official glory. And the true race that God always wanted gives up and literally veils it. Literally veils that kind of glory so that he may give the Father back the kind of glory that, that was in his heart when he created man in the first place. So we have uh, verse, um, let's see, verse 37. But though he had done so many miracles before them, yet they believed not on him, that the saying of Isaiah the prophet might be fulfilled, which he spoke, Lord, who hath believed our report, and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Now, I want you to see something. Just, it's just incredible if you'll just get it. This is the New Testament writers quoting an Old Testament passage to prove their point. And their point right here is that even though there was reason for official glory, they still didn't perceive him. They didn't get it. They didn't receive the report. They didn't get it. Because the arm of the Lord was not revealed. That revelation was the method. And, and I, I'd made a statement up here only what was discovered by faith, based not on acts of miracles, for many saw these, but acts of selfless nature were acknowledged. They couldn't get it. But Jesus was waiting for people to see literally past the, the miracle, past all of that, and to perceive his being, not even as Messiah. but the kind of being that he was. That's truly to know God. That's knowing God. Not knowing what he can do. Not knowing all the superpowers that he's endued, in, endued with, that imbued with it. We have, you know, either none of them or depending on what direction you go, we have all of them and we are supermen in ourselves because we can chase devils and do so and so you know and you've heard my argument with that why would god give us the power to chase devils demons out of our city to other people's cities i mean what kind of deal is that you know it's not there, there's something wrong with that i mean you know all we're thinking about getting them out of our city but they're going to go somewhere else so we're le unleashing them on other people why not invite them all to our city, live by Christ, and, and make them where they can't have any power at all? Instead of building a wall to keep them out, let's build a wall to keep them in and all live Christ. I mean, 
But to say that out there makes you sound like you're crazy. Okay, well, that's nothing new, so we're not going to worry about that one. Just like here, they're not going to get it unless they, Christ is revealed. Did you have your hand up back there? They wouldn't believe on him with all miracles of his official glory, so that when he finally manifests the glory of nature, they're not going to get it because he's only going to be known by revelation there. Right. And that's what the whole deal was. Yeah. And I'll get into that now. Uh, why that's even more important. We, we mentioned this in our last class, but I wanted to, um, I put it further in my notes because I wanted to make sure that we really get this in these first couple of classes because everything's going to be premised on this from here on. All right, when others lacked or were really needy or in misery, he would gladly serve their need. Now, you got to remember, a lot of these people just came for selfish reasons, and he knew it. Can, can I get an acknowledgement? Don't you think Jesus knew? You know, Jesus, Jesus, help me. I can't fix my situation. Make everything better for me. But you see, we might respond to that if we could get some official glory out of it. What's the point if we're not going to get any official glory? If people aren't going to raise me up higher as a result of my self-giving, why do it? Well, if it's truly self-giving, then you've already answered your question. You do it because it's giving of self. Jesus was always ready. They were in misery. They were hurting. They were in pain. He would always go to them and minister. I could show you examples that would make your heart bleed where he was used and abused and taken advantage of by people, and he still got up and ministered. Just amazingly was just, was going to do that. Because... If he was going to bring glory to God, the only glory that he had left was the glory of nature. And there were lots of opportunities that kept presenting themselves. (laughs) Isn't that incredible? Uh, He did not do it to gain official glory, but to disseminate the glory of nature. Yes, having their need met and being cared for, he should have received higher and higher official glory, but he did not. Am I right? (laughs) Would you not think that if somebody kept living selflessly and giving and pouring out and everything, that they should receive some official glory for that? And answer truthfully, should they not receive some official glory for that? Anybody want to answer that? I say the answer is they should, yeah. I mean, you don't do it for that. Jesus didn't do it for that. But that, but you should because you are constantly giving and helping people. You should get some official glory for that. However, that's not the case with Jesus. And it probably won't be the case with us. Um. The depth of his goodness was unknown to human eyes. I mean, that's that's sort of a bummer if you're if you have depths of goodness and of blessing and of compassion. It should not be unknown to human eyes. Okay, just truly understand this. You have to begin to realize that the motivation of the people was not to know who Jesus was, but was to get their need met. you got to understand that. If you don't understand that, then you're not going to understand why Jesus uh, 
And, and let, me say, let me say this in two ways. I hope you can grasp this. If, if you don't un see that, you don't understand it, you're, you're not going to understand, number one, why Jesus was deprived of official glory. Number two, why Jesus hid official glory or veiled it. Because it's all in how you look at it. If it's just being deprived of official glory, then Jesus has been robbed. But he thought it not robbery to have all the trappings and the privileges that go with Godhood. Are you following me? So we're talking about, we're talking about a comprehension of things about us in a whole nother light and a whole nother realm and a whole nother world than simply gaining glory for God in the way that most of us talk about it in, in modern day churches. Gaining glory for God by doing big things for him on an official level, by accomplishing great things for him. All of that being in, in the realm of official glory. And Jesus is veiling that now, don't you think Israel sort of wondered, why would God come down here, you know, in the wilderness, when they were in the wilderness, why would God come down here, dwell in our midst, but put a, a veil between us? And does that make any sense to anybody? I mean, he's the one who initiated this. He's the one who said he wanted to be among us. He came down here. He didn't bring us up there. He came down here. But then he, first thing he does is he puts a veil up so we can't really, really get in there and see him. was the same veil that Jesus put on when he came to this earth and he said I want them to see me for who I am in my being and to fall in love with that if you ever hear me talk about falling in love with the lamb that's what I'm talking about Jesus, from the, from the people's point of view, Jesus was deprived of official glory. There is absolutely no question about it. He was deprived of what should have rightfully come to him. He was robbed of it. But when you look at it from Jesus' point of view, this is what he lived for. Why would he work to convince them of things that would only take them down a road that was not the road he wanted them to come to? <clears throat> That's why he rejoiced. Flesh and blood have not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. But it doesn't take Peter long to go, you know, oh, not so, you know, we da 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 da. He starts denying the cross, which is the self giving spirit. It is the life giving spirit. It is. And so Jesus starts dealing with him in a whole different level, starts dealing with him like he's the devil. Get behind me, Satan. What? I'm trying to protect you. I'm trying to protect your glory. I'm trying to protect. Folks, that's the problem. We're always trying to protect ourselves we had a situation during the conference that was you know somebody said well there's somebody negative that's going to come and they're going to talk to people and say a bunch of stuff and they said that to me two or three different times there's some oh you know you need to do so you need to go talk to somebody or go do this or that well I was waiting for the Lord to deal with the person who was telling me this and eventually the time came when I finally had to say do you think that for all of these years I have willingly laid down my life, I have not spoken up, I have not fought back, that now all of a sudden I'm going to do that? <laughs> That's just, I was just, I didn't say anything back because I was waiting for God to deal with you. Let God bring on what he's going to bring on. I'm not going to violate the Lord in the process. Well, if you comprehend that that is what brings glory to God and nothing short of that, not let's bring glory to God by killing off all enemies. 
you know, what? By taking arms and against a sea of troubles and by opposing in them. Remember? <laughs> Shakespeare. Mallory gave me a, a copy right here. I'm pleased to tell you, because I didn't look at it, that most of it was quoted right. Thank you. And that's what we want to do. We want to be victorious. But what if the victory is a self-giving life? What if the victory is Christ? What if the victory is the Lamb? What if the symbol of the victory is the Lamb as though it had been slain on the throne? On the throne. That's resurrection, but that's victory, but it still looks like a little lamb that's been slain. That's what it looks like. No, more than that, that's what it is in its being. So we keep departing from that. We keep protecting ourselves. We keep working to look good. To Well, if I can't look good to them, I'll try to look good to, you know, these. Well, somebody's thinking a thought about you that's... <laughs> I can't change minds or, you know, no, I take it back. I can change minds. I can convince, I can talk to someone. Do you understand what I'm saying? I can talk to somebody and maybe even change their mind. But what good is that? Because somebody will eventually will come along or they'll read something somewhere and they'll be swayed back again. I can't change it. You can't change it. You won't be able to change it. But you don't want to change it. You want to live for God. You want the Lamb to live through you. And you want, in the end, to see all glory goes to the Lamb. And guess what? They are with the Lamb. Remember we talked about they are with the Lamb. And somebody said to me, yeah, in the beginning was, oh, I said, in the beginning was the Word. The Word was with God. The Word was God. It's you, here's how I'm with you. I'm not just with you. I am God. I am one with you, you see. I'm, I'm with you by oneness. And that's the bride. Don't say you're a bride. Don't say you're a bride if you're not the bride of the wife of the Lamb. Don't say it. Don't say it. Don't lie to yourself. Don't say it because it's not true. All right, let me read, because I, this is going to, you know, if I keep this up, we ain't going to have anybody in this class. Yes. A little louder. Because we got to hear. Um, if the bride knows the husband, then she has to see past the veil and his image. I mean, she has to know by revelation, or she can't. What does she know if she doesn't know who he is? If she can't know who he is, except she sees it by revelation, not by observation. All right, so let me give another angle here. To some, Jesus is like the sun. So let's uh, take the words out of these two circles, and we will draw one of these circles is S-O-N, sun. The other one is S-U-N, sun. Okay? To some, Jesus is like the sun. He is there as light and warmth with no thought of him. I mean, how many of you really, I mean, even if, if you went out tomorrow and all this cold weather was gone and the sun was shining and you just felt the rays on your face, would you really go, it's the sun? Or would you say, oh, man, the sun feels great, but you're really talking about the warmth. You, you know? Well, it makes me, he makes me feel warm and fuzzy, you know? Well, the cross will shave some of the fuzziness off. 
<laughs> to some, Jesus is like the sun. He is there as light and warmth with no thought of him, only what he does. So they enjoy his rays. They use them, and they look forward to his presence. <laughs> you get it? The sun in that light is simply a tool for our benefit or it enhances, and we'll, we'll go over that quite a bit as we go along, but it enhances our official glory or position or comfort. It's enhancing something that has nothing to do with who he is. And in fact, we're simply using him. Now, have you ever seen the S-U-N, the sun, say, I ain't coming up today. I'm tired of you people using me. I mean, you can set your clock, your watch to it. He's coming. He's coming again. We're in darkness. We're cold. We're the, but don't worry. The sun, the sun will, how's it going to come out? Tomorrow, tomorrow. And I feel like I got a little orphan up here with me, but he's. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> All right, so they look forward to his presence, but they have little consciousness of the heart behind it all. That's important. And I'll tell you exactly why it's important. Because we are going to get into the Gospels in such a manner that we are going to see constantly that people are drawing warmth and light and help from this sun because the Lord is like a sun and shield but it's not the sun not the S-O-N the sun they don't know his heart and uh, we're going to see examples many examples of this and where there is oblivion in their minds absolutely no care to know the S-O-N just to draw the benefits of the S-U-N, the sun. <clears throat> all right. Uh, they have little consciousness of the heart behind it all or the person who freely gives it. The person who freely gives it. Man, the constant giving and little recognition, number one, you know, one reason why there's so little official recognition is there's so little recognition of the, the giving that's going on. Okay? That's just, just a fact. That's true in him and true in us if we're one. Yes? Right. Well, and that's, that's all of our case. And that's a good example that you just gave is um, he was so rich that he, he gave us a dime, which was a lot to us, but it was just nothing to him. But that angle comes primarily from a resource view, and, and, then, you, and then you ended with the, the proper thing, and that is, you know, I had no thought about his self-givingness. And this whole kenosis was to, was to whittle this thing down to where that's about all there was going to be to recognize. I mean, yes, yes, there were miracles, but still they didn't, they, though he did so many miracles among them, yet they did not acknowledge him and thus it is written by the prophet Isaiah, who hath believed our report? Who has the arm of the Lord been revealed? Perfect fulfillment of exactly what we're talking about and of what the scriptures uh, are maintaining here. <clears throat> so, he is almost like an inanimate object to them. 
But Jesus took away his bright, shining glory and became less like a sun, S-O-N, and more like a sun, S-U-N. He became warmth and light. He became all of those things to us, and we just treated him like an inanimate object and just took and took and took and took. And, and as Jennifer said, and it is still true, he gives and gives and gives and gives and gives. But one thing we have to realize, see, it's not just that he's got this huge pile that will never use up his stuff. It's not like that. It's more like he, because of this nature, does care about suffering and need. But I want you to, I want to say this, if I can say it correctly. He does not move to enhance your official glory. He moves to meet your needs. That's different. It's a completely different thing. How many of us have prayed for Jesus to do stuff that would enhance our official glory, that would make us look better to other people? Da, 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 da. He's not going to move. That's not a need. That's a want. But he is there and ready because that's his nature. But here's the deal now. But but we are supposed to be eventually awakened to this being that gives and gives and go, oh my God. Not just take and take with no thought of, you know, uh, like the, the seven branch candlestick in the, in the tabernacle filled with oil. Well, it's giving light, it's giving light, it's giving light, but it's also burning oil. Burning, burning, loss, 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 loss is causing light, light, light to us. Self-giving, what is that? So speaking of a picture, self-giving, 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 enhancing your ability to see and your presence into the things of God. Step one over, just go over to the altar of incense, Sweet savor, sweet savor, sweet savor. Incense, loss, loss, loss. Being reduced down and being burned up and being giving itself in its external form that, there, that God may get a sweet savor. Now that's, you know, that's it. Bread, the bread, the, the, the you know, table of showbread. All these seeds chosen, brought into the holy place, beaten up, taken away their individual identities, brought together into one mishmash of, of preparation to bring forth a loaf whereby others might consume. Self-giving. It's just continually this identification of this spirit. And, and yet, like people don't see it in the tabernacle, they didn't see it in Jesus. But some do. Some, some eventually, like, I mean, like the, the, the 12 uh, lepers, you remember that? Wasn't it 10 lepers? 10 lepers. And, and uh, one of them comes back and he falls down and he worships Jesus. You know, he began, you know. And Jesus says, were there not ten? Anybody picking up something there? He gave and gave and he's, he he's does it. And he's not saying, weren't there ten? Where's my official glory? That's not what he's saying. He's saying, you're the only one out of ten that perceives something beyond getting your own flesh stuff that you want. All right, we're getting short on time here. Um, so let me make sure I've read this. But Jesus took away his bright, shining glory and became less like a sun, S-O-N, and more like a sun, S-U-N. This light of God gave and asked nothing in return. They take without inquiring into the giving one. They could take and take and 
Only if they noticed would he respond to their inner hunger. Only if they noticed. Folks, many ministers are doing everything they can to bang a plate, you know, a metal plate, and make enough noise so someone will notice them so that they'll get official glory. Jesus would not work that thing. He would not work that process. He waited till somebody showed up, and if it's just one person that showed a hunger, he was there for them. Okay? Now, this is, this is important on a bunch of different levels. We say, well, you know, um, I wish God would take me to a better place or, or join me with a, a larger group or, you know, on and on and on and on, all these sort of things. Folks, I, I am, you know, God showed me a principle when we started in my living room. He showed me, in the beginning was the Word. And then he showed me that somebody began to get hold of that, and it was, in that case, it was John the Baptist. And he began to declare the Word. And then, and the story, it's there in John, you'll notice the progression. And then some of John's disciples who he's declaring the word, finally the word starts manifesting and people start following the manifested Christ. And from that there's a gathering and then it goes until today. And the Lord said, you know, I could have said, we don't have hardly anybody here. Um, we're meeting in a mobile home. Can it get any lower? <laughs> All I saw was the principle in John. It begins with the word. You want to have a beginning? You want to have it grow into something? Then you start with the word. But somebody's got to get hold of the word. And if they get hold of the word, they'll begin to declare him. And as they begin to declare, people will first be drawn to you, John the Baptist. But then as you... As, as you continue, he'll begin to be manifested. Then you'll say, there he is. And then people will begin to see the manifestation of Christ and the reality of it. And they'll be, their, their hearts will be separated from you unto him. And it will grow into whatever God wants. But we're just sitting around going, well, I just, I'm waiting for something. I just want something to happen. Anybody in this room, anybody listening to this or watching this, anywhere can have a beginning and grow into this thing if they'll just follow the principles. But the deal is we're waiting for somebody else to start something, somebody else to do something. We don't want to be a dying seed. We don't want to just start with nothing and, watch and, and do the principles right by the life of Christ. And when I say the principles, I'm talking about the life of Christ. But if we do, it's predestined. A seed brings forth many other seeds. It'll happen. It does happen. You say, well, what happened? I mean, you know, at one time this church was the fastest growing church in Denton. That's a fact. What happened? The cycle. The cycle starts over again. It starts over again. You, you don't lay down your life and then go, you know, this is the way many young Bible school students think. I'm going to lay down my life and then there's going to be a big harvest and a big resurrection and, and then it's going to get glorious and then I'll be out of the old death thing and I'll be on my way and things will be really cool. Well, it's true. There's death and resurrection, but folks, that's a cycle. You're going to be going through death and resurrection over and over and over and over and over and you might even or we might even be going through a death for something way bigger than what we ever saw. And some people don't even know how big it is now, and it is. I mean, I'm amazed at the people that still are in contact, or still are new people contacting us constantly. I mean, you know, Europe, there are people in many different countries now in Europe 
that are knocking at the door and wanting the Lord. And really, you know, I have, I have right here in my email the first translation in Spanish sent to me. I mean, in French sent to me. You know, it's begun. Well, did I do that? Did I make the contact? Did I go, oh, i got to work my, my, my networking? <laughs> i got to work this thing. The only thing I've really worked on is decreasing that Christ may increase. That's, what, that's my job. That's what I work on. And if everybody left turned on me, it wouldn't change my, my responsibility. Do you understand? It wouldn't change what I must do, and I will do. You say, well, by the grace of God, you better add by the grace of God. <laughs> Everything has been by the grace of God. I, that goes without saying. You say, well, no, you should say it. Trust me, God knows the being that he's brought me to, and it's oneness with Christ is my only hope. I stand on no other ground. My hope is built on nothing less, you know. All other ground is sinking sand for me. So I got nowhere, you know, where will you go? Jesus, you have the words of eternal life. I'm with you. This, I'm with you to the end. You know what I mean? That's not, in my case, that's not a nice saying, Christian saying. You say, oh, I'm with Jesus to the end. <laughs> no, I'm pretty sure. It's, you know, it's like this. I'm with you, you know, I'm, I'm with you, Lord, to the end. He goes, okay, well, the end's here. You know, <laughs> okay, I'm with you. You know, I am. Well, I'm not talking about me or something great or this or that, but I am talking about this, this reality of this precious lamb gets on the inside of you, and he takes you over. And that's why I began our New Year's Eve service with saying people don't get this. Well, you know what? I get it. <laughs> I don't get it all. I don't know it all. But I get it, and it's about him. And that's, that's who I'm sticking with to the end. And there's going to be a resurrection, but there's going to be another opportunity for death constantly. All right, sorry I got carried away on all that. This light of God gave and asked nothing in return. They take without inquiring into the giving one. They could take and take, and only if they noticed would he respond to their inner hunger. Boy, we're, we're really, uh, we really should quit right here. I know we're not, yeah, I know we're not full there, but I just think this is a good stopping point. That's the disadvantage of going off on things that pertain to our times and not necessarily uh, comprehended by people in another time. Father, we ask you to break the bread of life to each person, those in the room, those who are listening, those who are watching, those who hear this or receive this in some written form, if that ever be the case, that you feed them on the bread of life, your son that you take them into the tabernacle and you walk them around and you explain everything by your heart and your view and your eyes. Father, Father, Father. Father them. Thank you for open hearts and hungry souls who are, have set themselves in spite of the difficulties. I am but one small cog in a big wheel that turns with many hearts that are after you even greater than anything I could imagine. Feed them, Father on Jesus, the bread of life. Let them become seers. Let them 
Let the arm of the Lord be revealed to him. Let him believe the report of the lamb in that chapter that those verses refer to. We ask in Jesus' name, amen.